वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस वर्चुअल डेज ऑफ द सेकंड महात्मा गांधी मेमोरियल लेक्चर 2023 टुडे वी वर्चुअली गैदर हियर टू मेमोरियलाइज एंड ऑनर द लेगेसी ऑफ द फादर ऑफ आवर नेशन मोहनदास करमचंद गांधी और मार्टिन लूथर किंग जे गांधी जी is universal as a and to impact the on it eternal by exploring his ideas and values and bringing together I will just mention you the background to reflect on this of this day. We are blessed to have the opportunity to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice Judge Supreme Court of India and the Bureau of Justice. It is an honor to be here. Honorable Mr. Sunny, Chief Justice High Court of Chief Chancellor of HNLU, as a guest of honor. I would also like to welcome Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir. Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan and respected registrar Sir Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, I further acknowledge the presence of the deans of HNLU, our learned faculty, staff, and so on. I welcome you all to this day and this lecture. Yes, Chief. No, Mr. Sir. Good evening, Sir. Delhi has at its help a renowned academician and administrator, Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan. Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Vivekanandan has three decades of teaching and research experience in legal education, particularly IP and AP, Internet Law, and has also served at National Law School, Bangalore, and Nalsar University of Law, Hyderabad, and was also the dean at Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law at. IIT Kharagpur and the founding dean of the School of Law at Bennett University at Nalsar he also served as the MHRD chair professor he was also the convener of the common law entrance admission test 2022 at the Hidayatullah National Law University sir has been spearheading numerous initiatives aimed towards ensuring that Hidayatullah National Law University makes a mark in the international legal community May I now invite Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan to deliver his opening remarks? I hope I am audible. Yes. Thank yes, you. sir. You are. Thank you, Honorable Mr. Justice Anirudha Bose, Judge of Supreme Court of India, and Visitor of Idaytulla National Law University. who has kindly consented today to deliver the memorial lecture honorable mr justice arup kumar goswami chief justice of the high court of chatisgarh and chancellor of hnlu who has also consented to be the guest of honor registrar professor uday shankar deans faculty of hnlu students staff and other guests who have joined for this program we fondly recollect the first memorial lecture was delivered by mr abhishek manu singhvi a senior counsel and member of parliament last year on 30th january presided by our honorable chancellor and we also witnessed opening of the mahatma gandhi statue in our campus mahatma is a celebrated as a philosopher par excellence interestingly he chose law as his career but the tipping point happened in durban to become eventually a thought leader to the world his self exploration into the concepts of truth non violence is still disseminated by scholars which has resulted into a philosophical branch called as gandhian studies in india and in the world his involvement in the independence movement after the return from south africa changed the contours of the indian struggle and finally we achieved independence he was loved and hated too but he never hated anyone he loved humanity and all life forms in the planet if the durban incident would not have happened 
will Mahatma be just Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, a lawyer? Someone analyzed that the various legal systems in the past and present in many jurisdictions is about regulating behavior and penalizing those who do not obey the law. The penalizing element can be short or long incarceration or even death penalty. Probably this is not part of the crux of the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi who found love as the prescription and not any form of mental or physical violence acceptable to him or probably that is one reason we could not really fit him into certain level of lawyering and legal system present in the world. His brush with the law, of course to a colonial state, did result into his unique insights about the subject of law and conscience subjection. He said, I quote, an unjust law is itself a species of violence. Arrest for its breach is more so. Now, the law of non-violence says that violence should be resisted not by counter-violence but by non-violence. This I do by breaking the law and by peacefully submitting to arrest and imprisonment. His philosophy of love versus penalty can be summarized by his quote, an eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. His views on state can be analyzed when he says the ideally non-violent state will be an ordered anarchy. The state is best governed, which is governed the least. He went on to say every person in a well-ordered state is fully conscious of both his responsibilities and his rights. Maybe many of these convictions and prescriptions are too far-fetched in our world legal system. And that is why probably we kept him in a pedestal as a philosopher of life, but not to be in the pantheon of jurists. This is a question begging. On the event today, a lecture will be delivered by our honorable visitor, who is a scholarly jurist, whom I had the opportunity to share the dais at the Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law in IIT Kharagpur a few years ago. As a judge for around two decades in high courts and Supreme Court, his judgments on important cases are definitely case studies for law students. To say a couple of them in recent times, in Gurmeet Singh versus State of Punjab, where it is relating to a case of a dowry death, it was argued by the accused that without any charges under sections of IPC or under a convict or in section 304B cannot be sustained. He, he did remark in that particular case, if I quote, although cruelty is a common thread existing in both the offenses. However, the ingredients of each offense are distinct and must be proved separately by the prosecution. If a case is made out, there can be a conviction under both the sections is something which he gave us a judgment. In another case of Sunny Abraham versus Union of India, it's a division bench case where not having the approval of the finance minister at the time of use of charge memorandum for carrying departmental inquiry would render it defective, not capable of being validated retrospectively by post facto approval. He pronounced life cannot be breathed into the stillborn charge memorandum. So we eagerly look forward to his lecture today on the changing contours of public law remedy, which will add to the repertoire of legal understanding to the discerning legal professions. We welcome you, sir, for this virtual meet and hope to have you in the campus soon in a physical meet. Honorable Chancellor, Mr. Justice Arup Kumar Goswami has been a mentor and a guide for the last two years to HNLU and have always supported and encouraged our engagements. Known for his acumen, discipline and focus on details on any matter which is in front of him, he has de delivered several judgments. The students who are joined here will be thrilled to know that his lordship represented Assam in Ranji Trophy and also represented East Zone under 19 and under 22 at the senior level. Sir, I wish to inform you, there was a cricket match yesterday between HNLU students and faculty, where the fa my faculty fought very well, but lost to a better team of students. Sir, we do welcome you and look forward to your remarks and to be in campus sometime. To discuss about the public law remedy on this martyr day, in fact, is a tribute to the father of our nation, of his love for the dignity of the individual and his belief of a minimal government and a state. With these remarks, I hand over to the anchor for further proceedings. Thank you, sir.
The guest of honor of today's Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture 2023 is Honorable Sri Justice Arup Kumar Goswami, Chief Justice of High Court of Chhattisgarh and Chancellor Hidayatullah National Law University. Honorable Mr. Justice Arup Kumar Goswami, born in Joharat, Assam, holds a LLB degree from Government Law College, Guwahati. Soon after, he enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of Assam, Nagaland, Meghalaya, Manipur, Tripura, Mysoram, and Arunachal Pradesh. He was designated as a senior advocate by the Guwahati High Court in 2004 and has served as the standing counsel of Karbi Angalong Autonomous Council and North Kachar Hills Autonomous Council, Education Department, Government of Assam, and High Court of Guwahati. Justice Goswami was appointed as an additional judge and subsequently permanent judge of the Guwahati High Court in 2011 and 2012 respectively. He has also served as the executive chairman of the State Legal Services Authority for the state of Nagaland, Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. Justice Goswami was appointed as the Chief Justice Acting of the Guwahati High Court in 2018 and subsequently he was appointed as the Chief Justice of the High Court of Sikkim in 2019. In January 2021, he assumed charge of the Office of the Chief Justice, High Court of Andhra Pradesh. Justice Goswami took over as the Chief Justice, High Court of Chhattisgarh with effect from October 12, 2021. May I now invite Honorable Mr. Justice Arup Kumar Goswami, Chief Justice of High Court of Chhattisgarh and Chancellor Hidayatullah National Law University to address the gathering. Namaskar. My Lord Justice Sri Anuruddha Bose, Judge Supreme Court of India and visitor of HNLU. My esteemed colleagues of the High Court of Chhattisgarh, Vice Chancellor of HNLU, Professor B.C. Vivekanandan, Registrar of HNLU, faculty, students, and staff of HNLU, and other guests who have joined this program. I'm happy to be part of this event, a memorial lecture instituted on the name of the Father of the Nation, which is conducted annually on the Martyrs' Day. A day to remember the ideals of the Mahatma, who is revered all over the world. For the legal fraternity, it is important to remember that Mahatma's journey started as a lawyer who fought injustice in South Africa. He is considered a humanist par excellence, and he redefined ethical values which every world citizen should emulate. In today's context, topic of the memorial lecture assumes great significance and importance. The Constitution of India recognizes as fundamental rights many of the individual rights which are largely in the nature of civil and political rights. The framers have clearly spelled out the right to seek judicial redress before the Honorable Supreme Court and the High Courts for enforcement and protection of these rights. The right to seek constitutional remedy is a singular provision under the Constitution. The Indian judiciary has a unique position under the Constitution as an independent organ of the state designed to provide a check on the functioning of the other two organs in their respective spheres. Judicial review legitimizes striking down executive, quasi-judicial, and legislative actions and confers the power to interpret the Constitution on the judiciary. This power strength strengthens the principles of constitutionalism. The Supreme Court's declaration of the law is mandatorily binding on all courts within the territory of India. All authorities, civil and judicial, in the territory of India have to act in aid of the Supreme Court of India. The role of the courts over the seven decades of its working have undergone a transformation that has witnessed its emergence as a dynamic institution playing an active role in expanding the scope and content of individual and collective rights of citizens. 
Judicial review is considered a remedy of last resort. It is to be presumed that the aggrieved person has tried other avenues to resolve the problems before approaching the court of law. The nature of judicial review is not about righting wrongs, but is a way of determining the fairness in the decision-making process. The judges are not required to examine the merit of any particular decision by a public body, but has to ensure that the decision-making process has been undertaken in accordance with law. The court has aptly widened the responsibility to give remedy to the citizens who are vulnerable and belong to the periphery of the social structure by relaxing the rule of locus standi. The court has observed that where a legal wrong or legal injury is caused to a person or to a determinate class of persons by reason of violation of any constitutional or legal right or any burden is imposed in contravention of any constitutional or legal provision or without any authority of law or any such legal wrong or legal injury or legal burden is threatened and such person or determinate class of persons is by reason of poverty, helplessness, or being in socially and economically disadvantaged position, unable to approach the court for relief, any member of the public can maintain an application for an appropriate direction, order, or writ in the High Court under Article 226 of the Constitution of India, and in case of any fundamental right of such person or determinate class of persons in the Supreme Court under Article 32, seeking judicial redress for the legal wrong or injury caused to such person or determinate class of persons. The social justice requirement mandates that the concept of locus standi should not be treated in a dogmatic manner. Public interest litigation, popularly known as PIL, has strengthened the constitutional ethos and broadened the ambit of judicial intervention on a wide, wide range of issues such as environmental degradation, accountability, and good governance. Considering the nature of matters flagged under PIL jurisdiction, the court has been devising a newer form of remedy under Article 32 of the Constitution. We are all eagerly waiting to hear my Lord Justice Bose, and therefore, I will not stand in the way any longer. With these few words, I thank you all for giving me a patient hearing. Thank you. Enjoy him. Namaskar. Thank you, sir, for your insightful words. It is indeed a matter of great privilege and honor to invite to this virtual days a chief guest for the second Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture, Honorable Mr. Justice Anirudh Bose, Judge of Supreme Court of India and the visitor of Hidayatullah National University. Born on 11th April 1959 sir, in Kolkata, sir completed his higher secondary education from St. Lawrence High School, Kolkata, and his BCom from St. Xavier's College. Further, Sir pursued law from Surendranath College of Law, Kolkata. Justice Bose started his career as a practicing advocate in the Calcutta High Court on civil matters for 19 long years. In the year 2004, Sir was appointed as the judge of the Calcutta High Court where he served for nearly 14 years till early 2018. Sir was then appointed as the Chief Justice of the Jharkhand High Court by the then President Sri Ramnath Kovind. On 24 May 2018, he was appointed as the Supreme Court Judge by the then President Sri Ramnath Kovind on the recommendation of the Collegium headed by the then Chief Justice Sri Ranjan Gogoi. In his long and illustrious career, Sir has been part of many landmark judgments and we are honoured to have Sir as our Chief Guest in the second Mahatma Gandhi Lecture Series. Thus, without any further ado, may I now invite Honourable Mr. Justice Aniruddha Bose to deliver the lecture on the topic, Changing Counters of Public Law Remedy. Please, Sir. Good evening to you all and uh, Honorable Sri Ruth Kumar Gassani, the Chief Justice, Chhattisgarh High Court, and old friend of mine, Professor Vivekanandan, Learned Vice Chancellor of Hidayatullah National Law University, whom also I have known for a reasonably long time. The teaching faculty and 
last but not the least not the least important in today's program dear students primarily for whom i shall speak today it is indeed a great honor to be associated with this institution one of the foremost law universities of this country and i consider it to be a great privilege for being invited to deliver this lecture dedicated to mahatma gandhi for whom we mourn today he was a lawyer a barrister himself and practiced for about 22 years before taking up a more important cause there is another would have been lawyer connection with raipur uh, possibly the airport is not possibly is named after swami vivekananda that is the only airport in india to my knowledge which is uh, named after him he was also training for as a lawyer but fortunately for the society and unfortunately for the profession he chose not to pursue this profession and dedicate himself for greater good so the small misfortunes the profession of law should suffer as well as mahatma gandhi his legal legal philosophy did not see law as an adversary and profession he was a reconciler himself and he mainly tried to resolve the dispute through a process of uh, process of negotiation uh a process to which we are also slowly progressing in the form of adr mediation etc now we are infusing that spirit of reconciliation into our legal system but in this time disputes mainly evolved over uh, uh, the private commercial or property related dispute late 19th century it was in the private field the world was largely divided among a few colonial powers which were ruled by the king or queen and in the colonizer countries themselves the principle of sovereign immunity prevailed which stunted the growth of public law in a way major exception was the united states of america the us had decolonized itself with the war of independence 1774 and laid down the foundation of judicial review in 1803 through the case of marbury versus madison a case all of you must read i am addressing the students going back to our own country and other common law jurisdictions the principles of sovereign immunity was slowly being dismantled at the end of 19th century and a new body of jurisprudence had started emerging when i entered the field of law in the early 80s state presence in multitude activities was strongly felt a j p taylor a celebrated english historian in his english history said until 9 august 1914 a sensible law abiding englishman could pass through life and hardly notice the existence of the state beyond the post office and the policeman so that was the state of state presence in life in general in pre first world war england and august was the month england joined the first world war this limited state presence in day to day activities though might not have been true in our ancient society where there was a strongly entrenched administrative system but here we are not doing that comparative study here now 
the subject is changing contours of public law. Now, all of us know what public law is, but it's difficult to define. Essentially, the relationship between the state and the citizen or a impersonal subject, which is defined by law. Now it started changing in the post Second World War era, which saw a rapid expansion of state activities. In India also, all the today we understand something, we naturally feel in essential state activities, but it wasn't then earlier. For instance, railways were running uh, or run by private operators under license. In fact, uh, this Calcutta and uh, Chhattisgarh connection is through the BNR that time, Bengal Nagpur Railway, which had a big setup in Bilaspur where the high court is. Now, what happened? Now, this in our country, the same practice we followed in 50s and 60s. The state was almost in every walk of life. And courts ensured that the obligation of the state to act within the constitutional boundaries was not confined to essential sovereign anti, um, activities, but whichever activity state was doing, there was an added obligation beyond that, beyond that of a private individual that state had to conform to its uh, requirement, um, conform to the constitutional requirement of not acting arbitrarily and following the due process, complying with the principles of natural justice. These are mostly developed in commercial law. You read the 1980 or a later judgment is, uh, which is not quoted, not um, uh, quoted much nowadays, the case of Sri Lanka Big Dati. Was in the 1992 Supreme Court, if I recall correctly. This succinctly lays down the obligation of the state to adhere to the constitutional values in dealing with the citizens or corporate citizens and not behave like a private individual. A private corporation buying some goods, they need not adhere to this whole tendering process and L1 in all the law universities they struggle with this. Professor Vivekananda must be uh, but, uh, I'm going, he's having to go beyond uh, his field of teaching and look at the uh, tenders. And I am kind of associated with the NMJS uh, Calcutta also. They are also every now and then this question comes. Now, why did we or did I suggest or select this subject? Today, the state is in the process of withdrawing from many of the activities. This is the policy matter over which we have a little uh, say and we should not, the profession of law ought not to concern itself much, but this is what is happening. Many functions we understood to be essential state functions are also being outsourced. You have privately operated road to VOLT. 
contracts, communications, don't rely on the state uh, telephone anymore. It's just uh, go to a pawn shop and you know, to come back with a mobile connection. The second big factor is many individuals at the global level are performing these functions on their own and it's a multi-country operation, particularly technology tech companies, we are dependent on them like you. Uh, today itself, this virtual meeting is with the aid of a company which has global presence. Now, the third change is many commercial issues are being uh, dealt with by uh, some kind of private justice system arbitration with minimal judicial review. So, then uh, in this chain perspective, what is the role of public law? I'm not saying role of the court, but public law uh, diminishing in its importance, or we as we shall see a rejuvenated or reinvigorated public law to deal with this changed economic system. What what comes foremost? This change system is as to whether a private person who is performing some duty which is public in nature be brought within the public law regime with its own remedy and own. Uh, the principles operating its jurisprudence. The private bodies were earlier also not beyond the public law remedy. Here, I'll make a distinction. There is own public law and also public law remedy. Public law remedy, if uh, you want me to give a easy description, it's the writ remedies, which is implemented through Article 226 or Article 32 of the Constitution of India. The writ remedy, the, if you read Article 226, it doesn't confine its jurisdiction to state. It goes to other authorities or person also. So through various judicial pronouncement, those private bodies who are discharging essential uh, functions state function as well, were being brought within this constitutional regime, which uh, is the other name of public law. And the foundation of that was if you are doing a public duty, then you have some added responsibility in your dealings with individuals, like electricity companies, 
were uh, in, the, in the private sector were subjected to the read jurisdiction. Private colleges in their the du their duties were being categorized. One is their administrative function. They are possibly they dealt as uh, private operators, but in the teaching area, law courts have held. We have held that you have to adhere to the constitutional obligations. That one eighty nine judgment is there. Amatabandhu, which has been expanded and explained later on. Sri Yamadi, uh, I'll give you this citation. We have a judgment now, a five judge bench, which was delivered on 3rd January this year. Which has held that Article 19 and 21 are enforceable against private bodies also. This is Koshal Kishan against State of Uttar Pradesh and others in repetition criminal number 113. A very erudite judgment written by my colleague. Honorable Justice B. Ramasubramanian. So, now the question which is emerging is that whether private bodies who are performing this or operating in public field, they, they have a grievance that why are they being forced to comply with certain added responsibilities beyond that of a normal private individual, even they're dealing with private disputes. Now, this is an area where, which is emerging today, and we'll hear more of it from various judgments which have come. Is there something called essential state activities? Then what shall be the form? You can enforce your right under Article 19, 21, through the process of civil suit or as well. There's no bar. So will that have to be explored? What if in an arbitration co uh, uh, contract or an arbitration, uh, an arbitrable dispute, a constitutional question emerges? What will that? Rule of an arbitrator. Will the arbitrator test the validity of such action under Article 14, 19 or not? On the whole, there is an expansion of jurisdiction globally. Continental Europe for a long time they did not acknowledge or they acknowledged but the scope of public law was limited. But now with European Court of Human Rights and various by various uh, directives of the uh, this EU European Union. 
the continent, continental uh, Europe is also being subjected to ad, uh, adherence to certain basic human values, which is what the read quote enforces. I, I started saying that uh, as when I joined the legal profession, I a writ code was the natural destination. The law was evolving there. There was uh, Kasturi Lal, then later Olga Telis, prior to that Maneka Gandhi, then promissory estoppel. But now I find most of the students are very keen on ADR and IPR. But public law is also an absorbing field. And by practicing public law, you also come to the root of the legal problems which prevail in our country. The litigant profile has also changed. We have all these early 20th century decisions thoughtfully rendered judici judicial committee. But who are the litigants? Who could afford to come to court there? These are mostly big zamindars who could afford to enter the portals of the court. And criminal cases. But today, of course, big corporates will have to litigate uh, to judicial uh, process because the nature of their activities give rise to many disputes. But also you find landless proper dismissed workman, a person who is being denied pension, also coming into the coming to the High Court. And that way, we have made our legal system available to a large number of persons. It, it hasn't reached every corner. And we are performing a kind of a paradoxical, we are undertaking a paradoxical exercise. At one level, PSL, we are giving you access to justice. At the other, we are trying to limit the number of litigation. So limiting is through the process of ADR and expanding is through the process of public remedy mostly. Now, are so many litigations good or bad? This is going slightly beyond the public law, the changing contours, but most of the litigations, the litigation expression is primarily due to uh, expansion of uh, the read jurisdiction. You leave aside the Negotiable Instruments Act or uh, matrimonial gender-related disputes. These are the two uh, subjects which dominate the criminal courts. But in the High Court, it is the writ which is the maximum in number, but in criminal appeals. My own view is it's better to have a docket explosion than empty dockets. The docket explosion also reflects the faith of the people in the judicial system. Of course, we are duty bound to con conclude a litigation within a reasonable time. There is no question about it. And there we are trying to evolve mechanism to do it. But at one level, it's great because in um, 
and the English court and the medical court, the type of litigants who can approach our court, you would find them. So expensive. There was an Irish judge. He had said that, uh, of course, everyone has access to justice. Like one has access to Leeds Hotel in London, very expensive hotel. Our country is not like that. And six, it is expanding and people are showing faith in our system. I think we need to be, we meaning the legal community, judges, lawyers, law professors, and also law students, to innovate, to ensure every person who is deprived can come to the court and his grievance be addressed and redressed at the earliest. Because uh, Aid by court of uh, Oliver Holmes, the Oliver Wendell Holmes, celebrated uh, American jurist. In his book on common law, the first uh, lecture itself, there's one line. The life of the law has not been logic. It has been experience. So we evolved through experience. We don't evolve through mathematical precision. And uh, I end here. And uh, if time permits, we can have some interaction. Yes, ma'am engaging and enlightening lecture. We are sure that after such engrossing and informative lectures, the members of the audience would have many curiosities and questions to ask from an eminent panel of guests. We request the audience to type their questions in the Q&A chat box. We request you to keep your questions precise and specific to the topic of our discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, can I comment? Uh... Yes, absolutely, yeah. sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, such an enlightening uh, session on public law remedy. Uh, my question, sir, relates to uh, the doctrine of proportionality, which is being used nowadays to examine the constitutionality of the governmental action. And uh, proportionality doctrine largely based on the idea of public good, which in a way also enables the court to get into the content part of the decision making. So, sir, how do you see this uh, public law remedy getting shaped up with the court evolving newer doctrines to look into the constitutional matters? See, there's a bigger answer and a precise answer. The bigger answer is in the event it doesn't work, the legal system itself will uh, kind of limit its application. The answer at uh, micro level is just a step ahead of uh, witness value principle, is doctrine of proportionality. Now, what would one like? Do you like court not to address uh, something on merit and leave it to the administrative authority? Or uh, one would like uh, court to address uh, some decision on surface merit? It's court. Proportionality is not going very deep. But on the face of it, something astonishing. Court is intervening in those cases only. The administration's point of view is there that 
say the service jury students. I am dealing with my employee. I know how he is working. Why you would not tell us how to deal with my employee? In his working in, with me. That's logical, but that's not experience. Experience shows an element of bias of encryption. And it is because of this reason, possibly it has been introduced into our jurisprudence. Proportionality, which is actually testing the decision along with the decision making process. Now, uh, have I been able to? I am not a jurist. <laughs> I am a judge. So I have my own limitation in. So you are better placed, those uh, legal academics, to test efficacy of a particular field of jurisprudence. So we don't have much writing in public domain on law. Some judgment in which public is interested is delivered in the wide reporting. But on the intricacies of law, there is very little uh, writing. And possibly general people, I don't know how far they are interested. But there is big scope for a, at least a web magazine, which can deal with uh, emerging legal trends. This university itself can pioneer that. Because the quality of Harvard Law Review, Yale <coughs> Law Journal, don't have many uh, journals of that quality in India. So the uh, law professors will have to come for, forward now. In every important uh, case in the US Supreme Court, there is invariably a law professor involved. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one more question from Dr. Pankaj Jambarkar, Associate Professor at HNLU. Uh, uh, Vice Chancellor wanted to. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. I will take it. I will take it after that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, sir is asking, referring to the state of Bombay versus Narasu Appa Mali, wherein Supreme Court has taken a very neutral stand by saying personal laws are not the law within the purview of Article 13.3 B. Do you think that the approach adopted by the court is appropriate to address the matrimonial issues? which has somewhere failed to address the codified law? You can spare me from commenting on any recent judgment of Supreme Court. Yes, sir. Uh, because uh, the matter might come for me and I, I don't want to express my opinion okay. in advance. Okay, sir. Sir, then can I take another question, sir? So, uh, Dr. Paparo is asking whether there is a fine line between judicial overreach and judicial activism. If so, kindly throw some light on it. It's in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> Someone would like uh, judiciary to be more proactive. Someone would like not to be active at all and only resolve uh, intra-party inter -party disputes. But public law is not that. Public law is beyond the uh, 
doesn't enter, but touches upon policy issues. See, we have a system of uh, basic right, fundamental right, constitutional right. Under the constitution, we are obliged to interfere if there is a breach of that right. Continental Europe earlier did not have this system, even there was the absolute sovereignty of the parliament in the English uh, common law system. But there also, uh, I think, uh, Lord Cook of New Zealand. In one case, some poultry farm, I don't remember, he had made a very telling comment that some common law rights run so deep that even statutes may not encroach into them. Well, I'll, I'll give you the exact line. This, this view was criticized by another jurist come judge, Michael Carby, Australian. This is one of the rare cases of common law right which is not codified has been given precedence. In the poultry farm judgment, Lord Cook, Sir, may yes. I? Yes, may sir. I, may I give uh, present a query to the honourable speaker? Uh, there are commentators who say that with the Indian experiment of public interest litigation, the theoretical distinction of public law remedy and private law remedy has been merged in many cases like medical negligence to motor vehicle component if you see that that this this particular strong division from the roman law times has taken a different turn now what would be your uh, observation and comments star has taken since the daily of gas leak case possibly uh, mc mehta where compensation was given of uh, the person who died accident uh, gas leak of a private company. See, in this kind of cases, we are making a entry through a negative rule. That state has the duty to protect an individual from this kind of accidents. State fails in its duty, then court can direct the perpetrator of the tort visit to pay compensation. Now we have evolved this uh, constitutional tort. Yes, it's here to stay. See, a litigant is happy with the civil suit also. He, he, he doesn't have any particular preference. But to the constitutional route, in spite of delay, etc., it's comparatively lesser delay. That is why we have uh, we are encroaching with public law in private field. That's again the subject of study because it may be unique uh, in uh, common law jurisdictions. Yes. Uh, sir, if there are any further questions, I request our audience to type the questions on the Q&A chat box. You are more interested in the questions <laughs> on <or> litigation. <laughs> Which I hope not to answer. That is my shortcoming. Of being a sitting judge, I have many doubts sir. over so many things. But I sir, think. I believe there are no further questions. Thank you again, sir, for an informative session. I hand over the dice to my student anchor who will take it forward from here. Thank you, ma'am.
May I now invite Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, Registrar of Hidayatullah National University, to propose the vote of thanks. Please, sir. Thank you very much. A very good evening to all of you. I offer homage to all who have sacrificed their lives to see free and independent India on this Martyrs Day. Last year, the university decided to pay tribute to the sacrifices made by our freedom fighters by instituting memorial lecture in the name of Mahatma Gandhi. It is my honor and privilege to extend word of thanks to all the dignitaries on behalf of the university. On behalf of HNLU family, I thank Chief Guest Justice Sri Aniruddha Bose, Judge Supreme Court of India and Honorable Visitor of the University. Sir, we are grateful to you for accepting our invite to deliver the second edition of Memorial Lecture. Your thoughts on public law remedy and its ramification in the present time have given a food for thought for, to the students and the faculties. Thanks for giving the suggestion to create a platform in the form of Web Gene, which shall be a forum for academic discourse. Sir, we also eagerly look forward to welcome you in the campus. Let me also place on record my humble gratitude to our guest of honor, Justice Sri Arup Kumar Goswami, Chief Justice, High Court of Chhattisgarh and Honorable Chancellor of the University. The University has always received patronage from the Honorable Chancellor. Sir, the University looks forward for your guidance and encouragement in all our endeavor. Let me also take the opportunity to express gratefulness to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan for inspirational leadership. Sir, on behalf of all of us, I am thanking for conceptualizing the idea of Memorial Lecture in the name of inspirational persons. Thanks for all encouragement and support, sir. Also, on behalf of the University, I thank the students, faculties and staff for joining the second edition of the Memorial Lecture through virtual mode. Let me also thank IT team for making all the arrangements for uh, the online memorial lecture session. Thank you all. Very good evening to each one of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your words of wisdom. With this, we conclude the second Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture 2023. Once again, we on behalf of Hidayatullah National University thank the dignitaries for giving us the valuable time. With your permission, sir. I would like to close today's session, please, sir. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to be physically present in the university. <laughs>